Welcome everyone to, the, uh, to this week's physics colloquium. And it was uh, a theorist uh, in the 1960s, uh, J.A. Wheeler, who first coined the, the term black hole. And um, he invented a word, and I think, I think for, the, for that little joke, the rest of the world is still paying the price because we are uh, uh, all of us fascinated by it. Um, but for several decades, black hole has been a kind of theorist toy. I mean, you can, you can calculate about it. You can imagine you know, throwing your students in, or um, you can even make pictures like this. But actually observing one, uh, um, well, you can't observe one, obviously, because it's a black hole. And the other problem is that on the sky, they're really, really small. So it's a great pleasure today to welcome our speaker, Shepard Dol Doleman from MIT Haystack Observatory, to tell us how we can observe these things. And Shep Doleman um, tells me he was, uh, that he, he kind of cut his scientific teeth uh, working on uh, interferometry in the, um, in, the, in the millimeter wave range, and especially observing um, silicon monoxide masers around um, late evolved stars, which are also, of course, uh, if you want to dissolve them, very, very small objects on the sky. And then one fine day he decided, yeah, silicon monoxide masers, yeah. Why don't I work on something else? something else that's small and which will interest everybody else. And so it's a, uh, we're, we're delighted to have him here today. Um, and uh, Shep, Shep tells me that uh, the last time he was in Switzerland, it was there to buy um, uh, atomic clocks. He'd heard that they make really good clocks in Switzerland. Um, uh, but we're very glad to have him here today to tell us what you can actually do with atomic clocks. So. Please welcome Shep Toleman. Thanks, President Okay, Can everyone hear me? Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, Prasenjit. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, to give the physics colloquium and talk to you about a project that we call the Event Horizon Telescope. And quite simply put, uh, the goals are not modest. We would like to observe and image a black hole with event horizon scale resolution. And a few years ago, this would have been kind of unthinkable. We wouldn't have thought that such a project were even possible. But there have been scientific observations, and there are now some very important technical advances that now make it almost sure that we can pull this off. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of those technical advances, the scientific observations that will allow us to open a new window on the study of black hole physics on event horizon scales giving us the possibility of investigating general relativity in the strong field regime, the accretion and outflow at the black hole boundary, and the formation of relativistic jets that distribute matter and energy on galactic scales, because the very big start as the very small. So the, the first thing, though, I want to say is that this is a huge collaboration, which is multinational. Uh, the only way you're able to, to pull this off is to get uh, buy-in by uh, the entire universe, really, and we're funded by the National Science Foundation. And the reason we need so many people is because the way we're going to do this is to build a submillimeter VLBI network, a very long baseline interferometer with which we can synthesize a virtual telescope as large as the Earth itself. That's how we get the angular resolution we need to image these very, very small objects. So we need buy-in globally. So first, let's start off with a well-known friend, Centaurus A, the closest one of the closest active galactic nuclei that we know of. It's an optical uh, image, and it shows dust lanes uh, going along this way. It's actually eating a smaller galaxy, so we're seeing some indigestion here. There's a bunch of star formation here. But when you look at it in the radio, you see something very different. You see a collimated outflow of relativistic charged particles lighting up with synchrotron radiation when charged particles circle around magnetic fields. And they're all pointing back to an incredibly compact region at the center. And energetically, 
the best model we have for how this works is that there's accretion of matter onto a supermassive, very compact object, a, a black hole. And it's the liberation of that accreted energy that gives you these outflows. And they're directed because the black hole has a spin. So it has a preferred axis north and south. If you like X-rays, here's the same jet, but also seen by the Chandra telescope. So wonderful, magnificent images that show one of the most energetic phenomena in the universe. So let's review for a second what is, what is a black hole. It's a relatively recent phenomenon, as Prasenji told us. In 1915, Einstein developed general relativity in which he merged a, ge a geometric vision of gravity with, with uh, special relativity. And just the next year, Carl Schwarzschild shows that there was a point source solution that was admitted. You could crush everything down into a point source. And he found a metric that describes space-time around that. And from that, we got the Schwarzschild radius, a radius inside of which nothing can ever escape from the gravitational pull of the black hole. It's a one-way door out of our universe. And I think that's what captures people's imagination about the black holes. It's a knot that you can tie, but never untie. And in 1930s, there was the realization that this was not just a theoretical construct, that matter really could compact into a, into a point source, that stars could be so massive they could run away, gravitationally collapse. That was work by Chandra Sekhar and Oppenheimer. And in the 60s and 70s, there's been mounting evidence that there are stellar mass black holes, the results of these amazing supernovae explosions, but also supermassive black holes that weigh millions of times the mass of our sun in the center of galaxies. And what I want to convince you of in this talk is that the way that we view macroscopic active galactic nuclei, these are the centers of galaxies that emit these, these are horrendously powerful jets, that the way we look at them is not the only way to look at them currently. Right now, we look at these as jet engines, exhaust nozzles of immense power. And we study this region out here, looking for pressure balance between the jet and the external medium, things like that. But what's happening here? What if we had infinite resolution goggles and could see what was happening right around the black hole to drive this jet? Well, if we did this, then we'd see strong GR effects. So the first thing we would see is the shadow of the black hole, because when you have a luminous soup and a black hole is embedded in that soup, the light rays that leave behind the black hole circle around to our line of sight. And you wind up with an annulus or a ring at what's called the last photon orbit. This is the last orbit that light can travel on before it gets sucked in forever. And it happens whether you're spinning, whether the black hole is spinning, or whether it's not spinning. Now, this is remarkable, because the size of that shadow is not described by the temperature of the gas or the pressure of the gas. Einstein tells us exactly how big that's supposed to be. Nine halves times the Schwarzschild radius, 2 gm over c squared. And if it's spinning, oh, I'm sorry, that's if it's spinning. If it's not spinning, it's the square root of 27. Now, how often do you get somebody telling you that the size of the thing you're going to measure is the square root of 27 times something? And given that, if we measure the size of the shadow, we'll get the mass. And there's some wonderful work done by uh, Tim Johansson and Dimitri Saltis on this. Bardeen first talked about this shadow. It was reawoken by these investigators um, and it's just amazing to think that we can possibly do this. But there are other strong GR effects. We talked about light. That's how, li that's, how it, that's how it appears to us with light rays. But matter also is constrained to do very bizarre things near the black hole. If the black hole is spinning, is not spinning, the matter can only be on a circular orbit a certain distance from the black hole. Any closer, it gets sucked in. And that's different from the Newtonian version. If you just look at Newtonian gravity, in a circular orbit, you should be going at this speed, right? And we know something strange has to happen close to the black hole because the closer you get in, the higher the speed. This predicts infinite speed, but we know that V equals C when you're at the gravitational radius of the black hole. So we know that this is the scale on which Newton has to break down because it predicts faster than light speeds. Now, the cool thing is that if you are orbiting the black hole, if there's a, this accretion disk of matter is orbiting the black hole in the opposite sense of the spin, then you have to be really far out. 
in order to maintain that circular orbit. But if you're spinning with the black hole, that innermost stable circular orbit shrinks to almost nothing. So the spin of the black hole encodes how big this region is. And that will become very important later. The last thing is that the time it takes you to orbit that black hole is also dependent on the spin. The bigger the spin of the black hole, the shorter the period. And for the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, which is about four million times the mass of our sun, this ranges from 30 minutes to four minutes. Every four minutes, something can orbit this impossibly large and massive black hole. So we are after big questions. We are trying to answer, is there an event horizon? It was Einstein right in the strong gravity case? How does matter get in and then get directed out of these uh, black holes? Uh, do black holes have spin? And how do they launch those magnificent jets? So first, our first target is Sagittarius A star. This is an amazing movie which shows stars orbiting an unseen mass at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, usually what I would say at this point is if this doesn't knock your socks off, then your socks are way too tight, okay? I mean, this is just startling stuff when stars act like planets. The, the, the model here is that there's a supermassive black hole unseen that weighs about four million solar masses. And the scale that we're after, the event horizon size, the Schwarzschild radius size, is equal to 10 micro arc seconds. Okay, so to resolve this, we need to start thinking about building a telescope with which, on Earth, you could read the date on a coin that your friend was holding up in Los Angeles when you are in New York. That's the level of angular resolution we need, about 2,000 times that of the Hubble Space Telescope. So we have this black hole, we have these, these orbits, but we also know that it's not moving with respect to the background quasars. So we know that it has to weigh a lot, and it has to be at the dynamical center of the galaxy. Furthermore, we see these X-ray flares that are very short in duration, so the light crossing time of this object, whatever it is, is only about um, equivalent to, to 10 Schwarzschild radii. And we also see that it emits these variations compared to background stars. So in the X-ray and the infrared, it's very variable. <clears throat> so it has to be very small, it has to be very massive, and it has to be at the center of the galaxy. So to capture an image of this object, we need to get very good resolution. And resolution is basically the wavelength of light you observe at divided by the diameter of your dish. For single dishes, you might hope to be able to resolve a coin half a football field away with radio techniques. But if you combine different dishes together, such as the very large array in New Mexico, you could detect a coin in Basel. Have I got the spelling of that right? Is it Basel? Okay. So a coin in, in Basel, about you know, a couple hundred kilometers away. And if you take your dishes and spread them out around the world, you can resolve a coin in South Africa. And this is, all, this is at a wavelength of 1.3 centimeters. The only way, though, to get the resolutions that we need is to push that very long baseline interferometry technique, where you take dishes around the world and combine them together, and look at very short wavelengths, frontier wavelengths. Then you start getting resolutions that are commensurate with that shadow size, which is about five times the Schwarzschild radius. Okay, so in theory, this can be done. You also need to go to high frequencies because between us and the center of the galaxy, there's a scattering screen. There's a lot of ionized gas which blurs the image. But it's a lambda squared effect, so the shorter the wavelength, the more easily you can peer through to the center of the galaxy. Now, uh, Prasenjit talked about atomic clocks, and in order to take data at these widely separated points, bring them together, and process them to give us the resolution of an Earth-sized virtual telescope, we have to record them with very stable clocks. And as was said, the best place to go for clocks, of course, is Switzerland. Uh, I buy mine in Neuchâtel from a place called T4 Science. Um, we have not yet found a way to harness the reputation of the Swiss for chocolate uh, in this work, but we are working very hard on that, to, uh, sampling many different kinds of chocolate. So you record them faithfully on magnetic media, and then you bring them together at a central correlation facility 
to compare what you recorded here and what you recorded here, and you measure essentially a Fourier component of the brightness. You can think about these two dishes as a Young's double slit experiment, but run in reverse. Okay, instead of broadcasting two laser pinpoints and seeing a sinusoidal uh, formation on a screen, you run it in reverse and you're sampling a sinusoidal component of what you're looking at. So envision this as picking off Fourier components from the sky. And when you get enough of those, as the Earth turns and changes the orientation of your dishes, you can reverse transform that to brightness on the sky. There'll be a quiz on this later, so pay, pay attention. Um, so what did we used to use for this? I shudder when I look at this slide because my grad student days were spent in front of these reel-to-reel -reel recorders. But in the rear view mirror, we see these analog banks of filters, and we see magnetic uh, tapes that had to be changed. And the total cost for a VLBI station was about a million dollars. That's to faithfully record all that data I talked about. And now we've gone to uh, field programmable gate arrays. All of that is now on this chip. And we use banks of hard disk drives. We've reduced the cost down to about 75,000 US dollars per station. And we've increased the bandwidth by a factor of eight, dramatically increasing the sensitivity of these arrays. Why is that important? It's important because we need to go to very short wavelengths. So our dishes have to be very smooth. And it's very difficult to make a large, smooth dish. So the dishes we use for this high frequency, short wavelength work tend to be smaller, maybe 10 meters, 15 meters. To make up for that, we need to swallow a lot more bandwidth to increase our sensitivity. Now, when you do that, you can make measurements like the ones I'm going to talk about right now, in which we took one dish in California, one in Arizona, and one in Hawaii to observe Sagittarius A star, that four million solar mass black hole in the center of the galaxy. And this builds on a long history of work by many dedicated people who have been pursuing this uh, for a long, long time. And we found something really interesting. It turns out that on the short baseline between California and Arizona, we saw almost all of the energy we expected from Sagittarius A star. But on the long baseline, much of the radiation was gone. And we interpret that as the fact that Sag A star has to have a finite size. Because the farther apart you take your telescopes, the smaller your beam on the sky. So when the beam was big, we saw everything. When the beam is small, because some of it is outside the beam, you see less. So we were able to get a very, very robust size of the object that we were looking at. And it turns out the size is four Schwarzschild radii across. That's pretty, pretty exciting and interesting when you think about it. You're measuring something that's only a few Schwarzschild radii across. And the density is about, about 10 to the 23rd solar masses per cubic parsec. When you pack all those four million solar masses into that volume, it's incredibly dense. This is also very good evidence for the existence of an event horizon, because when something is that small, and if it didn't have an event horizon through which things would disappear forever, if it had a hard billiard ball surface, that surface would begin to glow. But we don't see the expected glow from Sagittarius A star. So this is very good evidence that we actually are seeing an event horizon for this source. Now the small size that we measured was curious for another reason. And that's because if you encapsulate a black hole with just an opaque sphere of emission, it actually looks bigger than you expect it to, to be. And that's because light rays leave from the sides and are bent around to you, so everything seems bigger. It's like those mirrors in cars that say the objects in the mirror are closer than they appear because they're so magnified. That's what the black hole is doing. And you can write down clearly what the expected size is based on the real size. And you can graph the diameter of the object versus how big it actually looks. And you can see that for a black hole, there's some minimum size. No matter how small you are around the black hole, it looks big, about five Schwarzschild radii. And we measured something down here. Now, how is that possible? How do we measure something smaller than the minimal size? We understand that through these simulations uh, done by theorists on you know, clusters of computers that show that when you have an orbiting disk of material, one side that's coming towards you is preferentially Doppler boosted, and it's very bright. This side is dim. So what we're seeing probably is emission off to one side of the black hole that has a small aspect ratio. That's how we interpret this result. So it's very interesting that now we're able to actually look at the accretion flow around the black hole itself. 
Now, when we talk about modeling of Sagittarius A star, we have to be careful because it's not your average black hole. Sagittarius A star is sipping from a teacup. It's very underluminous. The, the Eddington luminosity, or the maximum kind of luminosity you could get from a black hole, is about 10 to the 44 ergs per second. <clears throat> And there's a lot of gas and dust, as you could imagine, in the center of the galaxy. So there's more than enough accretion possibility there, you know, 10 to the minus fifth solar masses per year, or 10 to the minus third solar masses per year. And if even that falling onto the black hole were 10% efficient, you'd expect 10 to the 41 ergs. But we only see about 10 to the 36. So the models that we have for Sagittarius A star is that the gas is very hot, but before it can radiate, it gets sucked through the event horizon, and we never see it again. Okay, so there's a very specific class of models called um, radiatively inefficient accretion flow models. And some colleagues of mine, uh, Avery Broderick and Avi Loeb, in uh, Canada and Harvard, have taken these models that are parameterized by the spin of the black hole, the inclination of the accretion flow, and the orientation on the sky, and they fit our data to those models, and here's the best fit model, showing the shadow of the black hole that I showed you before. And what I want to show here is that we show the probability of all these models. And this is the inclination of the disk. And this is the spin of the black hole. And we're already beginning to rule out models that are face on. We know that the black hole can't be eating with an accretion disk which is face on like this because it would be too big and wouldn't be consistent with our VLBI data. So we're already beginning to constrain these models of accretion at the black hole boundary. Now let's go on to suspect number two. Okay, so Sag Star is probably the best case we're ever going to have. This is the next best case. This is a wonderful movie by Craig Walker and his group showing the outflow of a 2,000 times more massive black hole, but it's 2,000 times farther away. So it, it subtends about the same angle on the sky. The Schwarzschild radius for this one, instead of being 10 microarc seconds, is about 7 microarc seconds, still within range of VLBI. And the way we think these jets are launched <clears throat> is that the black hole and the accretion flow freeze in magnetic fields. And then these magnetic fields begin to turn, and differential rotation whips them around above and below the black hole, and charged particles get trapped on those magnetic fields. And they're spun out like beads on a wire through a centrifugal you know, torsion effect that accelerates them to relativistic speeds. But everything is in play here. The black hole is important, the accretion disk is important, and the magnetic fields are important. Now, M87 is a very interesting case because last year a Japanese group made a very important measurement. They were able to absolutely track the foot of that jet with frequency. And they saw that when you look at it with higher frequency, it tracks back to an asymptotic point. And that's just what you would expect if you had a nozzle, one of these jet engines, with an optical depth of one surface that creeps towards the black hole. Okay, because you only can see through at a given wavelength to the surface of maximum opacity. Okay, once you're at that point where the emission is optically thick to itself, you can't see anymore. The source shields itself in a certain way. You need to get higher frequencies to go deeper. But what was missing here was the size right at the throat, because the maximum size, the minimum size they got was about 20 or 30 Schwarzschild radii. That's pretty big compared to the black hole. But we were able to find the size of the actual foot point of the jet. We did a similar measurement to the one that we did for Sagittarius A star and fit again uh, for the size. And we find a size of about 40 micro arc seconds, which is about five and a half Schwarzschild radii. That's very well matched to the size on which we are going to extract energy from the black hole and accretion disk. So that is very strong evidence now that the base of the jet is really at the black hole. So we're at the actual engine. And that lets us do something very interesting. Because remember that innermost stable circular orbit that I told you about? That's the point where the temperature is the hottest, the density is biggest, and the magnetic field lines are the most condensed. That's where the foot point of the jet is going to be. That sets the scale for the size of the base of the jet. So here's the event horizon, and there's the innermost stable circular orbit. And we set the size that we measured 
to the size of the ISCO. And remember, the spin of the black hole affects the size of the ISCO. So what I'm showing here is the spin of the black hole and theoretical curves that come from the Einstein and Schwarzschild and Kerr metric of space-time around the black hole of the lensed ISCO diameter. Now remember, the ISCO could be so big, but it's going to appear to be larger than it really is because of the lensing ability of the black hole. And, what you've, and these are retrograde orbits. This is when the accretion disk is orbiting in the opposite direction of the black hole, and here it's when it's orbiting in the same direction. And here's our measurement. The thin blue line is the measurement of the size, and the light blue is the one sigma error. So if, by equating the size we saw to that innermost orbit, we're telling everyone, or we're telling people who believe this, what the spin of the black hole is, and the fact that it has to be prograde instead of retrograde. And that's important because from black hole evolution, we expect that these accretion disks will spin up black holes over time, so that the black hole is spinning in the same orientation as the accretion disk. So this fits in with models of how we think black holes evolve with their host galaxies. Now, everything I've shown you so far is with these three antennas, but the Earth is a very big place. We would love to increase the size of this network. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, add the LMT in Mexico. That's one of the nice things we'd, we'd like to do, and that immediately gives us many more uh, data points. ALMA is now coming online in Chile. That's going to be a very sensitive uh, new element of the array. And it also allows us to link up with the European dishes uh, in Plateau de Bure and Pico Valita in Spain and France. And then we have just gotten funding to put a VLBI system on the South Pole Telescope. Um, and that's a very wonderful site because it sees, this, it sees Sag Star all the time. And to do M87, we are working on putting a telescope in Greenland. So the array is really about to explode in size and capability. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we need to do to make this array really sing, and then I'll talk about what we can do once we have it online. So phasing ALMA is the most important objective right now for the Event Horizon Telescope. It increases our resolution because of the longer baselines by a factor of two, but it really explodes the sensitivity by a factor of 10. Uh, and this builds on a lot of work by others, and we have an international collaboration that's going to phase all these telescopes together to give us an effective 85-meter dish high in the Atacama Desert. And new receivers that we're building, wideband VLBI systems, and the ability to turn VLBI, VLBI on with the press of a button Oh, wow, that is so embarrassing. I turned this off. I, I, how can it make noise? Sorry, let me just see if I can turn this off. Uh, okay, super embarrassing. Okay, I think it's going to be okay. Can you kill that? Can you uh, <laughs> just put it in a drink or something like that? All right, so there are many new possibilities that we can, uh, uh, that we can attack with this. <clears throat> First, I showed you Though basically all the, all the fitting of those radiatively inefficient accretion flow models were done with two points. But when we add new dishes, the LMT, we fill in all these spacings that are going to allow us really to push those constraints on the models. And when we add ALMA, we get these very sensitive long baselines here. So the modeling alone is set to, to really be transformed. But most important is that now we can start to think about phase information. Everything I've shown you so far is with VLBI amplitude information, how big is the signal. But I haven't talked about that other Fourier, com other Fourier aspect of things, which is the phase. And the closure phase is the sum of, of interferometric phase, those Fourier components around a closed triangle of VLBI baselines. And it's a magical quantity. The reason it's magical is because any noise on any baseline due to calibration errors cancels out because it's a round robin measurement. So you're left with something that is directly reflective of structure on the sky. It's what we call a good observable. And using those kinds of observables, we've actually used the EHT to measure the innermost jet of this quasar calibrator. And you can see the closure phase deviates from zero. Zero would be if we had a point source or a circularly symmetric source. We clearly see this source cannot be symmetric. And that is the key to these three component models that we're now building for these quasars. 
Now, this is work done by a postdoc of mine at, the, at MIT, Rusen Liu. Now, why is phase important? Phase tells you everything. Here's an example. Here's a picture of a clock, and I decom we decompose that clock into amplitude and phase. Take the Fourier decomposition of it. We do the same thing for the picture of Walter Cronkite here. And here's what we do. We take the phases of the clock, and we just mash onto them the amplitudes of Walter Cronkite. And then we do the inverse Fourier transform. And what do we get? The clock. All the information is in the phases. We do the same thing for Walter. We decompose him. We add his phases to the amplitudes of the clock. We get Walter back. So we really need phase to start doing these imaging, these imaging prospects. And imaging is not as far away as you might think. So one of the things that we can first do with those closure phases is add them to those modeling uh, techniques that I was showing you before. So here's what we had before. But if you add only one closure phase, one extra station, and you enable yourselves to extract those Fourier phases, the, the region of allowed models shrinks dramatically. So right away we know that without imaging, we can do some very interesting things with the phase information. Now recently I was asked to give a talk, and the organizers of the, of the meeting said, here's your title. I, I wasn't given a choice, right? They said, Tell us about testing general relativity with imaging of supermassive black holes. And of course, nobody has ever imaged a supermassive black hole. So I said, well, this might as well be the title. Let's just test it with miracles. How about that? You know? <clears throat> they didn't like that title, so I went back to the first title. But imaging is not that far off. These are two separate models developed by two different theory groups. And they show what we'd expect to see at the base of that jet that I showed you before, M87. If the jet forms a little far out from the black hole itself, then you expect to see this beamed central region with a very slight shadow. But if it happens very close before the jet has had a chance to accelerate, then you see that shadow that I showed you before mostly due to the jet going in the opposite direction being lensed around to us. So very different models that differ at the event horizon. With the three stations that we've worked on so far, plus ALMA, we can begin using techniques from our optical interferometry colleagues to see the difference between these two. You begin to see the first hints of that shadow and that it's different from this one. And with seven stations, which is what we hope to be by 2015, we really begin to get some high enough fidelity here to differentiate between these. So I think we're much closer to actually imaging a black hole than we ever have been before. Now, imaging is great, but I told you before that Sag A star flares. So how do you take an image of something that flares? It'll blur the image. Well, there's a way to capture the dynamics in the accretion flow around Sag A star using only that closure phase I told you about. Here's an, an animation of a hot spot orbiting the galactic center. And this is a, a favored model for how Sag A star flares. And you can see that the light bending around Sag A star gives you these secondary and tertiary images. This is what Newton sees. This is what Einstein sees, radically different. You see these asymmetric structures because light rays loop around the black hole multiple times before they get to our line of sight. And so we asked ourselves, could we detect those just with closure phase? So here is the ALMA and KARMA, and now Hawaii has just come into view. And here's a model that's been made by Avery Broderick that shows a hotspot orbiting. And you can see the closure phase as a function of time looks like a heartbeat. In fact, I call this the heartbeat of the galactic center black hole, because this is what we could see with only three antennas, not imaging. And these are very large phase excursions, hundreds of degrees. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, but what signal-to-noise ratio do we have? Can we actually make this measurement? So we took that same model, actually a model equivalent to that, and we looked at the closure phase as a function of time with Hawaii, California, and one single dish in Chile. And we simulated the data that we thought we'd get using realistic noise. And the red curve here is the actual model. Now, with only one dish in Chile, you can't really tell what's going on. 
It's just way too noisy. So we could never do this with one dish. But with 10 dishes, you start to see that the points hug that line. And when we incorporate all 60 dishes or so in Alma, you get very exquisite signal-to-noise ratio. And by looking at these dips, we could hope to measure the period of something orbiting the black hole. And if we could measure the periodicity, then we get the spin. So what I would leave you with on, for on this slide is that we will soon have the signal-to-noise ratio to make these kinds of non-imaging but very important measurements around the black hole. Now, things are just not that easy, right? I mean, nature, is, nature never says, OK, I'll give you one little point source orbiting around this black hole. Very, very simple. Nature tends to do things like this. This is a wonderful uh, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulation uh, by Charles Gammy and Josh Dolenz, which shows that there's a lot of substructure there. It's going to be a mess. But what I would emphasize is that we'll soon have the signal-to-noise ratio to even trace these little features here. So I think there'll be some really interesting observations in the near future, even if something is this complicated. Now, there's another diagnostic that we can turn on with VLBI. I've only talked to you about total intensity light, but this light is polarized. Why is it polarized? Because we have ordered magnetic fields with electrons spinning around them, that synchrotron radiation, and the radiation is imprinted with the structure of those magnetic fields. And those fields are very ordered close to the event horizon. So this is that hotspot model that I showed you before. And you can see at different orbital phases, these ticks, which is the electrical vector of the polarization, changes. And using a trick of interferometry in which we phase reference one polarization against another, it's somewhat technical, but it's quite easily done. We can actually look at the ratio of polarized versus unpolar. OK, just please, let's. Uh, there, now that would be enough. We can look at the ratio as a function of time, and we see that that heartbeat returns, but now in polarized intensity. And the nice thing about this is we don't need three stations for this. This can be done with two stations, right? We only need two well-calibrated stations to get this observable. And in times when SAG star is quiescent, when it's not burping, when we're not trying to figure out if it's got indigestion, then you would see something like this, which is static, and then using the Alma dish paired with the South Pole dish, you see the beating here due to the polarized structures that change across the accretion disk. So there are a number of different ways that we can approach the event horizon using VLBI. And I'm encouraged because preliminary polarimetry results show that we might be seeing these ordered magnetic fields in quasars. So what I'm showing here is that same amplitude ratio as a function of time for quasar calibrators on a short baseline. And you see that there's almost no polarization, like under like 15%, 5%. But on the long baseline, where we narrow our focus and we can look at small scale structure near the event horizon, on this particular source here, it jumps up to 40, 60, even 80%. Now, these are preliminary results, and we need to verify them. But this seems to indicate that the closer we get into the black hole, the higher the linear polarization fraction that we see, which is very promising. That we can do the same thing for SAG-J star. And the last thing I'll talk about is testing Einstein. Because when you have this kind of potential fidelity, you can ask yourself, is it true that black holes are characterized by three numbers? The spin and the mass. Actually, that's it. The and the charge. But usually these things aren't charged. So it's the spin and the mass. They're like large elementary particles. Okay? And that's the no hair theorem. Okay? The no hair theorem says that the, everything is in a black hole is determined by its mass and its spin. But what if it wasn't? What if the black hole? What if the quadrupole, for example, of the black hole, which is something that should be expressible by only spin and mass, spin is A, mass is M, had this extra term epsilon on it? What if Einstein were wrong? And what if the no-hair theorem didn't hold? Then you would wind up getting very different orbits of light around the black hole. Right? So the location of the ISCO changes, and 
the, the way light is bent around changes. And this is uh, the work of a number of groups um, that try to tease out the theory behind this. And it turns out that we may be able to detect this with VLBI. So this is what Einstein would suggest that we see with the best fit radiatively inefficient accretion flow model. But when you crank up that epsilon parameter and you change the fabric of space-time, it squishes in the north-south direction. And when you go the other direction, it squishes in the east-west direction. So if we can measure with high fidelity the shape of that shadow, we can also say something about the validity of general relativity in the strong field regime. Now, can we do it? Well, what I'm showing you here is some of those same curves that I showed before, the amplitude, as a function of baseline length. And I'm showing, these mo I'm showing this model, actually all these models, as a function of epsilon here. And you can see that for some of the baselines, Hawaii to California, for example, we just don't have enough signal-to-noise ratio. We're never going to do this because the simulated data just covers all of the colors here. But on the LMT to Alma baseline, we have such exquisitely high signal-to-noise ratio that we can easily tease out the differences between these. And from the Alma to the, to the, uh, the SMT and, on, and Alma to Karma, we also have enough signal-to-noise ratio to distinguish between these. Now, I don't know if we can do this, but it's a very intriguing possibility that we'll be able to get a handle on strong GR and test whether the Kerr metric is the right one for a spinning black hole. And I like to think of this as being a real experiment. This is not a facility. Right? We're not going to say, oh, I want time on this submillimeter VLBI network to do X, Y, and Z. I like to think that this is a very focused scientific experiment, like a particle physics experiment. Right? So it's tightly focused, and the impact is very broad. It affects a lot of different parts of astronomy. And it looks more like an experiment than a facility, but it's about to really be an experiment. I mean, I've just been saying it's going to be an experiment, but there's something extraordinary that's about to happen to make it a real experiment. And that's that there's a cloud that weighs three times the mass of the Earth that's about to impact the black hole at the center of the galaxy. It's going to happen in the spring. I feel like a movie trailer. It's happening in the spring. You know, it's going to come. It's going to, it's going to be amazing. Uh, this is on the cover of Nature, and this is work done, a wonderful work done by Stefan Gelesen at uh, Max Planck Institute in Garching and the group there. Um, but when this happens, the accretion rate of SAG A star and the shape of the emission region around it should, may change dramatically. We honestly don't know what's going to happen. That's why it's a true impactor experiment. But it turns out that the cloud is already beginning to shear due to tidal forces, and some of it is going to be flung off this way, but some, it is thought, will in-spiral in and change the accretion rate, changing what we see. So uh, the time of the pericenter is in June, but the accretion might last for many, many years. So we need to get the Event Horizon Telescope up, up and running to take a time-lapse photo of this as it happens. So the roadmap going forward is pretty straightforward. Nothing that we need to do is really technically difficult. The real difficulty here is getting buy-in by the international community to get relatively simple modifications to each site and then have them all work together as one network. So we have a memorandum of understanding that's going to be drafted and signed by all the participants, hopefully committing telescope time to this. Uh, we have taken our project to phase ALMA and submitted it to the ALMA Development Steering Committee, which is a committee that oversees all new developments at ALMA. And that's been well received by the committee, and that project has passed the preliminary design review. So that's about to happen. We're working on bring the LMT, the Large Millimeter Telescope in Mexico, online. Uh, Greenland Telescope plans are underway. Uh, I'll show you a fringe test with the Apex dish in Chile, which shows that on the longest baselines, we can do 1.3 millimeter VLBI. We're doing full polarization, and we have a South Pole proposal that has been accepted and awarded funds. So on all cylinders, the EHT is about to make some progress. In May of this year, uh, we used the SMT in Arizona and the SMA in Hawaii and a single dish in Chile, and we got very strong fringes on a quasar calibrator. It's remarkable because this baseline is, I think, the longest baseline in terms of wavelengths that we've ever detected an extragalactic source on. I think, I think 
it sets a world record for angular resolution expressed as lambda over d. And it shows that we can do VLBI on these long baselines and that there is still structure on these small scales. So in summary, <coughs> we've confirmed Schwarzschild radius scale structure in SAG star. We've observed similarly compact structures in the M87 jet, so we know there's something there. A lot of people thought, well, you'll build these interferometers and there won't be any emission on these scales. But we know now that there is abundant structure on these very small scales waiting for us to image it. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that imaging an event horizon and observing those orbits are definitely within reach in under five years. Uh, as I said, the required technical work is very low risk. We're not building new detectors. We're just putting established equipment at these sites. And the early results validate the approach. And the high precision measurements are poised to link strong GR environments around black holes with macroscopic phenomena now. We can tie what's happening around the black hole to these large jets that operate on galactic scales. So I hope I've been able to convince you that the EHT is a reality, that we're about to be transformed in terms of data quality, and I hope to be able to report some exciting results to you over the next few years. Thank you very much. Well, we have time for some discussion. Questions, please. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll also, you, you, you point, I'll answer. Um, go ahead, Johnny, please. Oh, the GRMHD, right. So are you talking about this, oh, this one? Yeah, so what you're seeing here is, it is a GR MHD simulation, so it's magnetohydrodynamics, but with full GR encoding it. And there's an accretion flow around the black hole, and you're seeing the 230 gigahertz emission coming from that with full radiative transfer as it's been calculated. And what you see here is, this is that shadow that I was talking about. This is where some of the light rays are lensed around in the last photon orbit. And this is where it's Doppler beamed to us, and this is where it's Doppler de-boosted away from us. So the disk is coming out of the screen here and into the screen here. And you begin even to see some very, very faint jet structure here, but that's, this is a log logarithmic scale, so that's very, very faint stuff. Most of what you're seeing here is on this side right here where the red emission is. So this, the distance from here to here is about five Schwarzschild radii. Or for SAG star, that would be about 50 micro arc seconds. The size of a grapefruit pomplamoose on the moon. I don't know, how do you say it in German? I don't know. Grapefruit. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, Justin. Exactly. Yeah. Without a doubt, I'm going to come clean here and, uh, and say that I would, there not only might be degeneracies, I'm sure there are degeneracies. But it's interesting that we are in a regime now where we might be able to tease some of these out. So by combining polarimetry, by combining closure phase analysis, by combining imaging, we may have enough new observables to actually skewer some of these degeneracies and tease out the difference between a GR MHD flow and a non-standard GR. But what I wanted to communicate mostly with that view graph is that we have the raw signal-to-noise ratio to begin to do that. So fair, fair and very good question. There were some questions from, from here. Oh, excellent question. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to gloss over that. 
So basically, with connected element interferometry, the same frequency standard is driving two telescopes. Like, let's talk about the VLA. The same signal is being sent to both antennas. At the same time, at the same, at the same time. Well, it's fairly well synchronized, but it doesn't have to be absolutely synchronized well, because. Oh, yes, so, so let's back up for a minute with a connected element interferometry where they're tied by cables. Then the same clock goes out to both. They record the data. They can be a little bit non-synchronous, but it's the same actual clock going to both. And they come back on the same cables and they're correlated together, and you wind up getting a correlation peak from which you get your Fourier components. For VLBI, you can't, of course, connect them by cable. So you have a, a what you need is a very stable clock at both sites, so that even though they might be offset and not synchronous, you know that when you bring them back and correlate them together, there's no jitter due to the frequency standard between the two signals. And that's the real trick. That's why we have to go to Neuchâtel and get these masers from T4 Science because they're rock solid. If you tried to use, let's say, a quartz oscillator, the two signals would be vibrating back and forth like this, and you'd never be able to make the correlation. So we need, uh, and we only have to synchronize them to within about a microsecond, because we run these through a correlation machine which searches over delay for the point at which you get a maximal peak in the cross-correlation. So most important is to have a stable frequency base. That's why we need the atomic clocks. So the data are taken, in a sense, independently. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and the constraints on those clocks are very stringent and they increase the higher frequency you observe. That's why we pay very close attention to those, those references. Yeah. Christoph. So when you talk about places you feel like holes, and uh, that you should remember that any time you know, a star drops in, or two black holes collide, there's a short period where of course it's not a pure black hole because you know, the two horizons unite, and then mm -hmm. you have the ring down, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, was, did you want, was, was that a comment or? I I it was a comment. Oh, no, it's very. It's just an approximation. Exactly. For a stationary situation, it's correct. But for a situation. Yeah, no, it's, it's an excellent, excellent point. Uh, and, and a lot of math and computrons in clusters everywhere have gone into these massive in spirals and binaries. And there, you're interested in gravitational radiation, where the two bodies are of similar mass. You really release a lot of gravitational radiation. That's true. And when they merge, all bets are off. You get a, a transient, and the Kerr metric you know, changes. Or it's not really a, a, a black hole metric. But, but, Right, but in this, in this particular case, the amount of mass around the black hole is pretty small. So it turns out that we're totally dominated by the black hole here. So the Kerr metric should really hold to many orders of magnitude. If, if another black hole were to fall in, then all bets are off. But I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah. Simon, go ahead, yeah, please. Well, I'm going to be retired in 30 or 40 years, and I'll be doing nothing but eating chocolate, okay? So I'm going to be going to Neuchâtel for the chocolate, not for the atomic clocks. Well, I, I think what's happening now is that the receivers are going to get better. So right now, the digital VLBI instrumentation is just beginning to match the wide bandwidths of the receivers that we use. It used to be that we were only capturing a small fraction of the radio frequency spectrum. But now we're using these field programmable gate arrays and banks of hard disks, we're actually getting much more bandwidth that matches those. So I think one of the things that's gonna happen is receivers will get better, much larger bandwidth, and we'll capture even more bandwidth to make the whole array more sensitive. But in terms of space VLBI, we're, we're reaching the end of the Earth. 
the end of the earth. We're there. I mean, we're at the South Pole and we're at Greenland. So we really can't do better than that. Going to space, the difficulty is that the antennas tend to be small. And currently, the amount of data we're able to get back from those satellites is limited by the telemetry. In addition, we could be at diminishing returns. In other words, we know there's structure left on the scales we can measure from Earth. There may not be much left when you go into space, because there you're talking about really big baselines. And even for something like this, there may not be enough energy on those small scales to give you detections. So I think there will probably be probably be space VLBI missions. Maybe they'll go up to these high frequencies, although you run into real problems unfurling an antenna at these wavelengths in space. But that might happen, or you might get something on the moon. But the fringe spacing will be so fine, there may be nothing left here. I, I, th I think that we will be able to make the kind of measurements we want to with this array over the next 10 years. That's, my crystal ball is fairly clear. 30, I'm... I, I, I give up. Um, we have time for one or two questions, I think. Go ahead, Renato. But by using what? Oh. Uh, I have not heard about that. Yeah. It sounds very interesting. Uh, um, is there a way to actually put this into practice with current systems? Or? I think that's the idea. I mean, that's what this, this proposal was to use techniques that have been locked in the context of quantum information, like the uh, quantum crystals. I think they can be generated. It sounds interesting. I mean, is this something that, that Sajay Star has to cooperate with? Or this is just something based on the detectors? Oh, why didn't you say so? That, you know, I mean, it's... I see. It sounds interesting. You know, the, 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 the way the Event Horizon Telescope has, has proceeded is to really get more collaborators. So the more the merrier. If he, if, if he can help us out, I'm all for it, you know. So it, could, it sounds interesting. If I could ask a little supplementary to that. Uh, I mean, you described, you described the interferometers in, in terms of wave optics, which is fine. But how, are, are, you, are your quantum efficiencies high enough that what you, you, can talk, you can think of counting photons at this stage. Yeah, so, so you're talking about like an intensity interferometer or something like that, correlating the noise, is that? Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be that. That could be one example, but I was thinking of normal, normal interferometry, but can you, can you put it in terms of counting photons? Um, well, the, the amount of photons we get are just huge. They're enormous. So, so we're not at the point where we have to correlate individual photons. I think that the, the current method of doing correlation of broadband noise is the optimal way to get signal-to-noise ratio from these interferometers. I, I'd have to think about that a little bit more, though. But we're, we're definitely in the high photon count state here. Okay. Um, any more questions? Come on. Somebody asked a question about Hawking radiation or something. You've already had teleportation. Or, or not. <laughs> um, if not, well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you, Shakespeare. Thank you.